Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Dana Trupiana and I cover an infamous gangster every week in a true crime-like format. My show, Mob Times, comes out every Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. Well, it's Tuesday, it's 10 a.m., so here I am. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you're new here, welcome. If you've been here before, you guys know how much I love and appreciate you. I love that you're a part of this little family that I've built around me, and just thank you so much for all your love and support. I have a really long episode today, so I'm just going to skip the whole beginning and get right into today's gangster. Before I get into it, I do have to mention that today's gangster is straight Italian. Never step foot on American soil, villages in Italy, Italian. So that means that there's going to be a lot of names and places that I'm going to mess up. Give me a little bit of grace. I'm terrible at pronunciation, but I'm trying my best. Chances are I googled the name or place before I read it to see how it's pronounced. So if I still mess it up, I don't know. I suck. I'm sorry. It'll, it'll probably happen. talking about an Italian criminal and leading figure in the Sicilian Mafia. He was the 68th leader of the Corleone family, the mafia faction that originated in the town of Corleone. Luciano Leggio reigned as boss of bosses of the Sicilian Mafia in Sicily itself. I find the need to elaborate that it's Sicily itself because we have a lot of Sicilian gangsters in America that immigrated from Sicily, and we say the whole time that they're Sicilian mafiosi, but this man was born, bred, lived his whole life in Sicily, so there's a difference between the Sicilian gangsters that we're usually covering. Luciano Leggio was born on a misty winter day on January 6th, 1925, in a hovel at 2 Via Lanza, Corleone, near the police barracks. He was the fourth of 10 children of Rosa Maria Palazzo and Francesco Paolo Leggio. Leggio had nine siblings. I can't find the names of every single one of them, but I'll read off the ones that I know. He had a sister named Maria Antonina. He had a sister named Geralima, and he had a sister named Bernarda, and another named Carmela. He had a brother named Carmelo, and he had another named Salvatore. Maria Antonina was born in 1910. Geralima was born in 1913. Carmelo was born in 1921. Carmelo was born in 1927. Salvatore was born in 1930. And Bernardo was born in 1935. So Luciano was born in between Carmela and Carmelo. He dropped out of school in the fourth grade to avoid his parents' plan of having him enter the priesthood. And he didn't learn to read or write until he was well into adulthood. Which, honestly, it's super impressive that he learned at all. Usually, you learn to read and write as a kid because as a kid, you're a sponge. You're literally learning how to human. And you learn things a lot easier, but as an adult, it really feels hopeless sometimes. The fact that he was able to pick up reading and writing as an adult is super impressive, to say the least. By the age of 12, he was an excellent marksman, and he could handle almost any firearm that you handed him, which is not easy. I'm sure a lot of my viewers have a lot of experience with weapons, but as somebody that never fired a firearm until I was old, it's not easy to operate the three weapons that I have experience with, no less each one of them that there is, and they all handle and fire completely differently from each other. There's not really a lot of information about his family, but one thing is definitely for certain. He was raised in extreme poverty, and I'm talking like extreme can't put food on the table, extreme poverty. And he was raised on a small farm. That right there is hard enough. You take 10 children and two parents 
and shove them into a tiny little farmhouse together, and you have got a recipe for disaster. He quickly gained a reputation as being sort of a hothead, or a cuochu di tacca, which is Italian for bean on fire. In the dialect of Sicilian, he was frequently referred to as Lucianedu, and I don't know why, I'm not really sure what that means or what it translates to, but I see him being called that a lot, so I definitely wanted to mention it. He came to be known as being extremely cunning, ruthless, and shrewd. But as a kid, he was unable to read or write yet. And there's a legend in the town that he's from that in his late teens, he ordered a young teacher to teach him how to read and write, and she obeyed. He then laid the barrel of his pistol against her chest. I don't really know why... I guess to literally force her to teach him? I I don't know, man. He suffered from Potts disease, a tubercular spine condition known as tuberculosis spondylosis for his entire life. Unlike the lung disease that DiCarlo's brother died of, this one really isn't contagious. This condition is thought to have been brought on by consuming unpasteurized goat milk as a child and it required him to wear a very uncomfortable wooden brace, which he later replaced with a solid silver one. He walked with a noticeable stoop, which prompted a lot of people to call him Mulacini, or hunchback in Sicilian dialect, but obviously nobody ever said that to his face. Growing up, he was very sick. He was a frail child. He always kind of seemed like he was like, crumbling apart, and he was pale as a sheet. For the most part, Sicilians are very dark-skinned, so he would stand out in a crowd. If you're someone that has a very pale pallor, you're gonna be a lot different than the people around you in Sicily. When he was arrested at 18 years old for stealing corn, a police officer messed up his name when he was writing it down, and he wrote down Ligio, L-I-G-G-I-O. And Legio would be known and referred to as Legio for the rest of his life. It's the same issue that a lot of American immigrants experienced when somebody messes up your name on some kind of official document. Well, I guess you got a new name now. In an interview with Enzo Biaghi on television in 1989, he confirmed the correct pronunciation of his surname, and it was Legio, but he also said that he was really pleased that people thought that his name was Ligio. After all, a good mafioso is known for spreading misinformation. It's like the cop gave him an alias that allowed him to operate without being tracked by the police. Because technically, I would assume that if you're arrested and your name is listed as something that isn't your name, how can it go onto your record? Legio began as a peasant scassapadiagra. It's literally a thief stealing sheaves of wheat or a haystack robber. When he was in his early 20s, Legio and Vito di Frisca were caught stealing wheat, loading it onto the back of a mule, and kicking the poor little mule's backside all the way to the carabinieri barracks in town. That's super sad. Like, really said that poor baby was trying his best. He's helping you, and you kick him. Jerk. He was sentenced to three months in prison for this crime, and you already know how I feel about that. That was actually his second arrest. But while he was in jail for that three months, he met Salvatore Rina, who was 19 years old at the time, and he was just starting out a six-year sentence for manslaughter. The two eventually became accomplices, and after Reyna's release, the two got really close with each other. And they also became really close with two other criminals in the area, Caligaro Bagarella and Bernardo Provenzano. His first arrest was where he was arrested for stealing corn, and he was given a six-month prison sentence when he was 18 years old. This first arrest is also what led to his first killing. 
Six months after he got out of jail, on March 27th, 1945, he tracked down Coma Annie, the man who witnessed him steal the corn and ratted him out to the police, leading to him getting a six-month prison sentence, and unalived him outside of his home. Despite the fact that the victim's wife, Madalena Ribaudo, and her son Carmelo witnessed the crime, as did Legio's accomplice, Giovanni Pasqua, who later confessed and implicated Legio in the crime, the case against Legio dragged on for 18 years, and he was acquitted twice. We know that double jeopardy is not a thing in Italy based on the Amanda Knox case, so they can come after you for the same crime over and over and over again if they want to. He was only 19 years old when he killed Koma Ani. There's no record of him ever attempting or completing unaliving somebody before this point. So this is the first time that we know for a fact that he attempted and completed unaliving somebody. On April 29th, a month after killing Koma Ani, he killed Stanislaw Punzo, the compieri or estate guard of land that was owned by Dr. Corrado Caruso. The guard had caught him stealing a bag of grain off of the land. After unaliving Caruso, he assumed the position of the deceased and quickly forced the doctor to hand over the estate to him at gunpoint. Based on this occasion, he quickly rose to become Sicily's youngest gabayoto or estate manager. He was also the prime suspect in a third killing. That was Leo Luca Pidano, who was unalived on February 7th, 1948. And even though he was the prime suspect, he was acquitted of this unaliving on June 21st, 1950. So that suspicion or trial or whatever they were doing for this particular crime only lasted about two and a half years. A month later, he took part in an unaliving that would have an impact on Sicily for years to come. Legio, he was part of a group that represented the new mafia. He and his followers had absolutely nothing in common with the older generation of mafiosi who ran the Sicilian mafia at the time. Other than an innate talent for crime and a desire to be a part of La Cosa Nostra. Legio's life, it's all about money, and he made a name for himself as a phenomenally successful cattle thief early on. He was a hybrid of the local home-brewed mobster and a fusion of American-style gangsterism mimicked from the United States. So figure, like, the cliché gangster that you would see on American Mafia movies. Movies like Godfather. Not Godfather, because it's way before that, but like Godfather. There was other movies, other American gangster movies that portrayed the mafia at the time. And that's kind of the style that him and his followers and his friends, they all kind of had that American style. Exactly what you would expect to see an American Sicilian gangster to look like, that's what Legio kind of aspired to look like. Piero Calamandre, an Italian journalist, believed that Sicily had become the central incubator of American criminality. And he might have been correct. And if it was, Corleone was not only a part of that incubator, it was the insemination center. Members of the Sicilian Mafia, they didn't really see a need to have, like, a formal name. La Cosa Nostra that was a historical name, or even, like, the Mafia, that's a name that came from ancient Italy. But even though they didn't really see the need for it, the term Cosa Nostra was used in many Italian publications, and the reason for that is it would just distinguish the Sicilian Mafia from other criminal networks in the area. Because there's a lot of other criminal rackets at the time that had gone on that would be referred to as a mafia, such as the Camorra or the Neapolitan Mafia, but they weren't La Cosa Nostra. 
it's a whole different thing. It's like saying the Bloods or the Crips in America are in the mafia. They're not. It's a very different thing. So just because you see a bunch of Sicilians or a bunch of Italians in Italy operating gangs, it doesn't mean they're the same kind of gangs. So when the publications or newspapers or anything, when they would talk about this gang, they would talk about it in terms of La Cosa Nostra. Mafiosi would introduce known members as belonging to Cosa Nostra, which translates to our thing, or La Stessa Cosa, which translates to the same thing. For example, he is the same thing, a mafioso, as you are. Throughout its history, the Sicilian Mafia and its predecessors have used a bewildering amount and array of names to describe themselves, such as La Fratuzzi, which translates to Little Brothers, Stupagheri, or Cork Stoppers, La Fratellanza, or Brotherhood, Mano Fraterna, Zugio, and Fontana Nuova. So just like whatever name they felt like using for our thing at the moment, they would refer to themselves as. And because they're being chronicled for their entire history by the newspapers, the media, they kept track of everything they had ever called themselves. And now we have a million different names that they would assign to themselves. Mafiosi are commonly referred to amongst themselves as men of honor or men of respect. Things were a little bit different for Legio's mafia family boss. For him, life was all about power and prestige, as well as being a man of substance and honor. Money was, it was important to him, don't get me wrong, it was important, but in his list of priorities, it was not at the top. He didn't mainly aspire to be rich. He mainly aspired to be powerful, to be respected, to be honored. And that's just not how the younger generation was. Now, here comes Dr. Michel Navarra, who was the mayor, the chief medical officer, and the president of the Cultivators Association of Corleone, a decorated knight of merit of the Italian Republic, medical advisor to the state railways. In other words, he is very ingrained in his community and very, very well respected and honored and looked upon as a very, very prestigious man. Dr. Navarra took up the position in 1931 as a doctor at the hospital in the town of Corleone. He served during the war in Triste as an officer in the medical corps, and he rose to the rank of captain. When he returned to Corleone in 1942, he established a medical practice, and he started to dabble in politics, first with the Liberal Party and then with the Christian Democrats, who rose to power quickly after the 1939 to 1945 war, which we now know as World War II. In just two years, he consolidated his power, and he rose quickly to become a major figure in the town. In other words, instead of saying like, oh yeah, I run this, and I run this, and I run this, he said, hey, I am the one person that runs all of these things, and just kind of took it all and put it into a ball rather than having it flat out on a line that said, oh, I'm here, 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 and here. He took it all, bunched it up, and said, hey, I'm a super great guy. I do this, 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 and this. Navarra appeared to have everything, but he craved more. And so he mortgaged his soul to the mafia. He wanted absolute power, and the mafia was happy to give it to him. He was soon one of Sicily's top 10 bosses, and he helped to run the town, collect taxes, and he was known to minister to the needs of the community, primarily for his benefit and that of the local wealthy landowners. Now remember, when I talk about the mafia in Sicily, I am not talking about the same mafia that we see in America. The mafia in America is criminals. They are operating outside of the law, and sometimes they buy off cops, sometimes they don't. 
Either way, they are not following the laws. They don't work with police. If you work with police, you're known as a rat. In Sicily, the mafia is the government. This may have been a little bit after that because I know it was like right before World War II that Mussolini sent out these prefects and took out the mafia leaders. But at the end of the day, the mafia has a part in running the government of any town that they're operating within. So when I say that he's the mafia leader and he's also collecting taxes, that makes sense because the mafia and the government go hand in hand. Like, the mafia is the government in a lot of towns. When exactly Navarro took over as the head of the Corleone family or the Corleonesi is not 100% clear. It wasn't until 1954 that Caligaro Lobu finally passed away from diabetes, though. It does seem reasonable, though, to assume that he would have handed over control of the family prior to his passing because of his old age, and he was really sick before he died. So more than likely, whoever took over control, and, and in this case it was Navarra, he would have taken control much sooner than when the former boss died. He would have been controlling the family or the clan in this case for a long time. Dr. Navarra, he went through life with a sensitive and haunted expression. It always seemed like life had just done this man wrong. He always had a sad or depressed mood on him. And he was an individual who had a habit of gently clapping his hands together as if in time with music when he wanted to emphasize a point he was making. A very Italian trait. He was really into cards and hunting. He really enjoyed good food and wine. And he studied the diadem dynamics. I don't know what that is. I'm not going to research it. Absolutely not. Just by the name diadem dynamics, I don't want to know. I don't care. I don't care. If you're curious, you go look it up. But diadem dynamics are not going to be researched and not going to be talked about here. I guarantee you it's something revolving around religion. I don't know. It has something to do with art, maybe? It's hard because, like, nowadays, diadem dynamics are a software, so it's a little hard to research what it was before there were computers. So I'm not 100% sure what it is. It has something to do with art. Maybe? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. If you know, please let me know. Navarra, he was like a weird character. He's a doctor, so on one hand, he's arranging the cure of sick people. But then on the other hand, he's arranging to have some of them killed when it fits his agenda. So it's a very juxtaposition type of personality. It's like, okay, well... Why would you help that person and hurt that person? And it just kind of depended on the situation because he had no qualms in ordering a hit. The Corleonesi clan and the people in the town referred to him as Eupatri Nostra or Our Father. And when people said his name, they would make the sign of a cross. Dr. Navarra is almost certainly... The mafioso with the most respect and honor from the Catholic Church because of his dedication to helping people, helping the poor people of Corleone, and healing the sick people. The Catholic Church is well known for hating the mafia. In America, they don't allow them to have funerals. So somebody having a lot of respect from the church, it's a pretty big deal. In his first two years as mayor, the town experienced 57 murders, all of which were connected to the criminal underworld in the area. The assassination of Unionist Placado Rizzuto by Legio and two of his associates on the evening of March 10th, 1948, was one of the most well-known that fell within that two-year period. People in the town were alerted to the situation by Giuseppe Lezia, a 12-year-old little boy 
who had witnessed what happened and ran to the town to tell people in the town square what he had just witnessed. He told them that he saw Legio, he just said like a man, and two other men drag another man, who was Rizzuto, into an abandoned farmhouse and then beat him repeatedly and then shot him repeatedly. Because Letzia had run screaming to the town square, obviously something has to be done about it. So the young boy was brought to the hospital. Navara personally attended to him, and he pretty much told the town square, like, all right, I'll take him, I'll calm him down, don't worry, he's freaking out. Little boy is losing his goddamn mind, obviously. He just saw somebody get killed. So Navara is like, don't worry, I got this, I'm gonna bring him to the hospital, I'll calm him down, I'll bring him right back. While he was in the hospital... Navara personally attended to him. Within hours of arriving to the hospital, Letzia had passed away. In reality, Navara had been giving Letzia injections to calm him down. In all reality, these injections that Dr. Navara was giving him had been toxic levels of some drug or another since there had never been an inquest. We still have no idea what this little boy was injected with but it was toxic levels because he didn't make it. A fellow hospital physician who had helped Navara in drafting the death certificate of this child was so upset by what happened that he left town and emigrated from Italy altogether. He emigrated to Australia. So Navara, working with this other doctor in a hospital, literally noped this man out of Italy. This dude was like, yeah, no, screw this shit, and noped out to Australia. Rizzuto had been assassinated on Navarra's orders to stop union issues. The men that maintained Corleone's estates had been speaking up a little bit, and the mafia did not like this. Giuseppe Lezia was just a bystander and ended up losing his life because he witnessed a horrible atrocity and this situation is so sad like a 12 year old little boy lost his life because some gangsters couldn't operate quietly like you don't know how to keep your business clean and this 12 year old boy loses his life that that is so heart-wrenching can you imagine his family like oh my god i don't know the deaths that i report here they don't really bother me because it's always like gangsters, you know, they live this life and they know that they assume the risk of being taken out because they're living this life. But this 12 year old boy, he did not take on any risk. He didn't do anything wrong. So I don't know, this one's bothering me. I don't like it. Placado Risotto was a young idealistic supporter of the rights of the working men. And he really didn't care too much about the mafia's clear issues with what he was saying and doing. He wasn't afraid of them, and he didn't operate by their rules. Despite the fact that his father, Carmelo, had been a member of the Corleone Cosca for more than 30 years. Obviously, his father being a member for 30 years didn't save his life. I wonder about that father, like if he stayed in the area. There isn't any information out there about what happened to Risotto's dad after he died. I would love to watch this movie, but it's in Italian. There was a biopic written about Risotto and this situation in the year 2000, where Risotto is portrayed as a pure-hearted folk legend with a magnetic personality a rebel with a cause that people around him supported. Luciano the Lame, a newbie mafioso who envies Risotto and his fiance, who just so happens to be the daughter of Ligio's lover, is who everybody knows is behind Risotto's disappearance. It seems like a super interesting movie, and I swear to God, I would love, I would get off making this video tonight and then go and watch that movie if it wasn't in Italian. This is why I need somebody to teach me Italian. Because I should be able to go watch that movie. I really, 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 really wish I knew Italian so bad because I would love to go watch this. It seems so interesting. 
Risotto had made plans to meet with Dr. Navarra, who he believed was going to be arriving on the final bus from Palermo. They were supposed to have a business meeting about the specifics of the Fakuza district farm labor lists. Of course, this is all a setup. The doctor never showed up. He never had any plans on showing up. And it was just a setup to get Risotto alone so that Legio could get his hands on him. Instead, Risotto was kidnapped from the heart of a busy, unusually warm March evening and thrown into the back of a Fiat 1100 parked outside of the Church of San Leonardo and taken to a deserted farm estate where he was killed. Later on, the other men involved in this kidnapping do end up cooperating, and they say that Legio was the one that actually killed Risotto. He was the Mafia's 35th assassination of a union organizer in Sicily. The abduction and what happened afterwards was only witnessed by one person, and that was the 12-year-old boy that didn't make it. His father, Carmelo, and Giuseppe di Palermo, Placato's brother-in-law, went to the Comitieri barracks the next day and reported his son missing. And as soon as he knew that he was missing, since he had already known he was supposed to be meeting with Navarra the previous day, he already knew he was dead. He knew that the mafia had kidnapped and killed him. It was not really much of a question. Having been in this clan for 30 years, he's all too familiar with how the society operates. Legio's co-conspirators, Pascal Christion and Vincenzo Colora Jr., who actually had pretty significant ties to mafia members in New York, both later confessed to the murder and implicated Legio in the case. Nevertheless, Legio was never found guilty because his case was heard by three different judges over the course of the following 13 years, all who found him not guilty. These men confessed because the Carabinieri, they knew that these three men were the ones who kidnapped and killed Risotto. A tip came in from an informant, Giovanni Pasca, the same man who was with Legio when he killed Caligero Comagnani, he was in prison at the time, and he informed the prison governor that Chris Cohn and Colora were involved in the kidnapping, and the Carabinieri went directly to them, and as soon as they went to them, they confessed. Legio's lawyers, he had four lawyers, they successfully argued in the Court of Appeals in 1959 that the confessions of these two men were obtained by the use of police brutality. And because these confessions were obtained through police brutality, they were inadmissible and nobody should believe anything that came out of their mouths. Obviously, any confessions that were given were false. They can't be taken into account. And if there's no confession, there's nothing implicating Legio. Legio was never convicted for his role in the union activist's murder, even though the prosecutors hated him. Because he was always seen with a cigar in his hand while he was in court. It wasn't illegal to do that, but it was a pretty big sign of disrespect towards the prosecutors. It's pretty much like saying, yeah, I'm not really worried at all. I'm just sitting back, relaxing, just smoking a cigar while you guys try to put me away for the rest of my life. There's even a scene in the movie The Traitor where Legio is portrayed in this trial and he asks the judge permission to smoke a cigar because he needs it to help him breathe due to a health issue. It's said that other mafiosi in his clan would laugh behind his back that he really didn't smoke cigars. He only smoked cigars when there was a camera posted on him, and he was just posing with those cigars to make him look tougher. But he did not get down like that in private. On April 13th, 1948, Navarro was arrested for his role in the death of the little boy, Letzia, but he did not end up getting convicted of this crime. 
Colonel Alfredo Angrisani, the carabinieri officer in charge of Corleone, recommended that Navarra be sent into compulsory internal exile for five years. This recommendation was made after he was found not guilty. So in Italy, I guess it's possible to sentence you to something even though you weren't found guilty of something. So I know that Navarro was found not guilty of the little boy's death, but when Colonel Alfredo Ingrisani had recommended exile for five years, Navarro went into exile. That happened in 1948. But Navarra was able to return to Corleone in 1949 thanks to his contacts. Obviously, as the leader of the clan, he has some pretty significant contacts with politicians and a lot of men in power, particularly Angelo Vicari, who would soon be the head of the Palermo police. In Calabria, Navarro was able to establish really close relationships with some seriously important people. He was able to build a really close friendship with Indrangheta boss Antonio Macri, who led his own Indrine, or family mob clan, in Siderno. And this would come to be one of the first partnerships between the Sicilian Mafia and mainland organized crime. So it was pretty significant that this friendship took place. Leggio went about building his own crew within the family while also developing his Abbe Giotto sideline. Abbe Giotto in English means rustling, but in this sense, it means sheep stealing. So in other words, he's building his own network of farm robbers. He had also joined the notorious cattle rustlers, the Barbaccia family, when he was in his late teens. So as he got older, his relationship with that family got a lot closer. They came from Gadrano, a small village east of Corleone, and on the other side of Roca Busambra. They had a feud with the Lorello family, who were also rustlers, since 1918. So this feud has been lasting a really long time. Over 60 men would die before the feud ended, and it ended with the shotgun murder of a 10-year-old, Antonio Pecoraro, in 1959, and... He was the last male on the Lorello side who would have been forced to carry on the grudge if he had survived. So as sad as it is, and even though I can sit here and say, oh, if he was allowed to live, he would have just continued on with the war, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, this is a 10-year-old. These people have absolutely no regard for human life. Like, they're out here killing children like it's nothing. This is insanity. This is like nothing I have ever researched before. Because you look at the American Mafia and they are very strict on not harming any children, not harming any women. And you start talking about the Sicilian Mafia in like Sicily. And this is the second child under the age of 13 years old that I'm talking about their killing. It's wild. Leggio took over as the leader of the clan when Francesco Barbaccia, also known as Luzu Chiachu, vanished in 1944, not too long after Leggio joined the group. Did Leggio facilitate this man in disappearing so he could take the position of leader of the clan? I don't know. Does it seem like something that Leggio would do based on his personality? Absolutely. Even at the age of 19 years old, Leggio was already well known as a sanguinoso, a young man with a thirst for blood, and he was already exhibiting signs of his violent and psychopathic tendencies. When he got into his early 20s, Leggio had saved enough money to buy his own farm. The location that he purchased was called the Piana della Scala, and it was this like gigantic estate that was right in the shadow of a mountain. So the estate was gorgeous, the view was gorgeous, everything about this place was gorgeous, and he was super happy to purchase it on his own. Leggio's rise from an extremely poor peasant to enforcer and power force in the mafia and 
in large part, it's due to his reputation as a stone-cold killer. In his early years, Giacomo Rina, Caligero Bagarella, and Giovanni Rufino were his absolute closest allies in the gang that he was starting. He loved these guys. Giacomo Rina was the oldest member of the group. He was Toto Rina's uncle, and he was actually related to Legio through marriage. One of his sisters had married one of his brothers, something like that, but they were related. Giacomo was born in 1908. Legio and Giacomo Rina would later be arrested together and detained in 1942 for smuggling illegal cigarettes. Many Italian journalists claimed that Legio was the mastermind of the new mafia that developed in the wake of the 1958 events that happened between Legio and Navarra. And we'll get there. So how did Legio clean his money? Well, in a way that a lot of us are aware and have been aware for a long time that the mafia is involved in through mattress stores. Legio hooked up with Eminflex, the biggest mattress manufacturer in Italy, and he began cleaning his money using that company's enormous profits. I saw this TikTok that was talking about, like, conspiracy theories that you actually believe in, and the mafia running the mattress industry was one of them. And it made sense when the dude was saying, there are too many mattress stores and not enough demand for mattresses for these places to operate without being involved in crime. It really just doesn't even make sense. Police had been looking into Legio for drug trafficking, for illegal arms dealing, and he was doing that through Croatia. They'd been looking into him for trading in counterfeit money, and for his involvement in a hijacking and bank robbery ring that he was operating with Vincenzo Pozio, Salvatore D'Angelo, Antonio De Luca, and Angelo Pavone. Police departments believed that Rina was in charge of the northern branch of the family or clan, in other words, the Corleonesi faction of the Sicilian Mafia, which controls Milan and northern Italy. According to an Italian journalist, Christian Lovatelli Ravarino, Rina was unfathomable and possibly the most evil mafioso to have ever lived, which is saying a lot. Giacomo Rina, who was spending the remainder of his exile in Budrio, near Bologna, in northern Italy, would only ever be interviewed by Ravarino. So his opinion on this man, like, it actually mattered. Legio had a habit of thinking a lot bigger than the small town of Corleone where he came from. He wanted to grow and he wanted to expand. He wanted to broaden his horizons and reach what he saw as his full potential. He started earning income with slot machines, transport, trucking, and he started dealing illegal cigarettes and smuggling them across borders. He did not stop doing your typical mafia dirt, but he just added these new ventures on on top of it. Everybody in the province knew who he was and was scared of him. So when he muscled his way into the market and put a tax on the sale of all grain and wheat that was sold in the area so that he wouldn't steal it instead, nobody was really too surprised. He eventually cornered the market on pinball machines in the province of Palermo, and he ended up operating thousands of them. He generated about a billion lire a year from that venture alone, so that's an idea of what kind of income he's bringing in. So the lira that he was making in 1945 was equivalent to $1.5 million in U.S. money. If that was today's money, that would be equal to $24.8 million a year that this man is making in 1945. That is asinine. According to Angelo Mangano, Legio gushed money, and everybody knew it. He did not keep it a secret that he had money and he spent it. I got super confused when I read that because I was like, what the hell is a leer? So I went looking, and it turns out that the leer, which is plural for lira, 
It is the currency that was used in Italy between 1861 and 2002. Italy switched to the euro as the official currency in the country in 1999 for, like, literally for Y2K. They did it on December 31st, 1999. And in 2002, all currency was switched to the euro. I guess, like, a lira is like a dollar, and they just switched the one lira to one euro. And then in 2002, they changed, like, the fives, the tens, the twenties, the fifties, the hundreds. They switched all of that to the euro as well. So, fun little fact. There's an infamous story about one time when Legio went to the barber shop for a shave. He took his dark sunglasses off, and as soon as he took his dark sunglasses off and the barber realized who he was, he passed out in terror. And obviously, this is not due to like, oh, his eyes were so scary. No, he just recognized who he was. And because of what a fearsome and brutal reputation this man has, this barber got scared as hell and literally passed out. So that's going to tell you something about the kind of reputation that he has around the town that he's from. Following Risotto's disappearance and the uproar that ensued after that, Legio made himself invisible. And this was a habit of his. He would do that whenever there was like a high profile crime that he committed. He would just like go ghost. He would just disappear, and he did it over and over again. Because of his ability to just kind of vanish, the media created a special myth about a man that they began to call La Primula Rosa, the Scarlet Pimpernel of Corleone. While he was away, his cousins Francesco and Leo Luca Legio had handled all of his business, so his business didn't just come to a stop if he just decided to vanish for a year. His cousins would cover it. It was just like an everyday occurrence after a while when he would disappear because it, it, they were just used to it. In order to manage his business interests, he traveled between Palermo and Corleone pretty often. On February 5th, 1955, a man stumbled upon a body late in the night on State Highway 118. It was about 50 meters from the entrance to a tunnel that had recently been constructed. A heavy object had been used to smash the body's face, and multiple shots had been fired into the body, which was a pretty classic sign of mafia retaliation. It's just like the calling card that they leave. Figure, if somebody's a rat in America, you'll see, like, an actual rat shoved into their mouth. So shooting a body multiple times, that's just something that the mafia is known for. So as soon as this person found the body, or, I mean, even the police, they instantly knew it was involved with the mafia. Even though they knew it had something to do with the mafia, there is absolutely no evidence on this body at all. The body belonged to Claudio Splendido, and it was determined that he had been killed between 4.30 and 8.30 p.m. He worked as a night watchman and a guard for contractors, and those contractors had been building the highway that he was found on. His five sons and wife, Lucia Manina, were unable to provide any kind of motive or any reason that anybody would go after him. Police did detain two men and question them. Antonino Adamo and Michelangelo Labu. Recognize that last name? I do. In October of 1954, they chose to hold and question these two men in particular because in October of 1954, they had committed thefts from the construction site that was affected, and Splendido brought their names up as men that could be involved in the crime to the police. The men were eventually released after an investigation took place, and they were released because the investigation took such a long time to wrap up. But obviously, if Splendido had had a problem with these two men in the past and brought their name to authority, those two men are the first men that police are going to go after when something bad happens to Splendido. At the end of August 1955, magistrates looking into the death of Splendido came to the conclusion that there had been an unknown number of attackers, and the case was just closed. And that's kind of a regular thing to see in Italy. If there's not evidence, they are not going to leave it 
as like a cold case or an open case that's currently under investigation. They're just going to straight up close the case. The wife of Luciano Rea, who was imprisoned for criminal association and extortion, gave Angelo Mangano, the director of the regional police, a tip that her husband might have information about the Splendido killing on November 1st, 1966. That means that we are 10 years later, so there has been no movement in this case in 10 years. Rea told police that he had overheard a conversation where Vincenzo Rina had discussed Splendido's killing with another bunkmate. He said he overheard him talking about how Legio got worried that Splendido, the night watchman for the construction site, which also happened to be in the area that Lego preferred to have his meetings in, had overheard a conversation where they were just like gossiping about the dirt they do, and some negative information had come out in this conversation. So obviously, Splendido had to go. Since Splendido had already showed that he would work with the cops and give up names, and he had already given up two names in the past, Legio was like, yeah, Splendido, no modo. You gotta go, do. Rasatarse La Testa, or keeping quiet in mafia slang, was absolutely crucial if the Brotherhood was going to continue to do business and not be interrupted while they're doing it. It was necessary to get rid of men like Claudio Splendido because they pose a constant threat. Somebody that is willing to give up your name and has access to information about you is seriously dangerous. Also, Legio really did not care about killing people. It made absolutely no difference to him if he had to take someone out. So if you get on the wrong side of him, you, you're not going to make it, bro. Legio was charged with this murder 14 years later, probably from the testimony of the guy that was in jail, but he managed to escape being indicted on it. He managed to escape almost every single murder indictment that was ever brought against him, with the exception of only one. His ability to avoid jail time was made possible by the Italian court's right to acquit a defendant for lack of evidence rather than finding him guilty or innocent. Based on the 1728 Scottish law of not proven, it was finally abolished in Italy in 1988 as a part of a new judicial code. Legio and other people could easily invalidate the evidence by simply getting the witness to leave the scene. I don't really understand, if I'm being honest, how there's a difference between acquittal and being found innocent in Italy. In America, of course there's a difference, but in Italy, there's no such thing as double jeopardy. They can find you innocent and then bring you back. So I don't really know what the difference is between innocent and acquitted. I have no idea, but I don't know. Apparently it helps him get out of jail. He also benefited from law enforcement's lack of urgency or lack of interest in addressing the mafia or anything surrounding the mafia. Obviously, this is because the mafia is seriously lining their pockets and Money always makes interesting things a lot less interesting. Palmero's courts were staffed by a judiciary that was scared of the mafia and really lazy. Nobody really valued their job as a judge. There were also so many of these investigations being brought against mafia members that the trials became a little confusing. In Italy, there were more judges and court bureaucrats than full-time firefighters. So that'll give you a sense of the amount of investigations that are being brought because they're not going to hire judges if they don't need them. So they're constantly bringing cases against the mafia. And if you have case after case after case after case, obviously it's going to have an impact on your ability to manage these kind of cases. And eventually, I think a lot of the judges probably just ended up being like, you know what, it's not worth it, and just finding a lot of them not guilty. Because you also gotta think, there's judges that got killed for putting mafia members in jail. Luciano Rea, the guy that informed about Rena's conversation, turned out to be a soldier in the Corleone Cosca, and he ended up being the Sicilian Mafia's first acknowledged post-war informant. 
Later on, he was declared insane and put in hospitals and asylums before being released altogether. When he testified at the 114 trial in Catanzaro in 1969, defense lawyers claimed that his testimony was untrustworthy because he was homosexual. He fled Sicily after the trial and relocated to Piedmont. The only publicized informants in the Sicilian Mafia prior to Rea in the 20th century were Vincenzo Di Carlo, the boss of Raffadelli in Agrigento, who was identified by the Carbonari in 1963 as a collaboratore di giuista, or a collaborator of justice. Dr. Milchiore Allegra made a long and detailed confession to the Carbonari in 1937, even though it didn't come to light until it was published by the Sicilian newspaper. On February 24th, 1957, on a dark, cold evening, Niccolo Maggio, a police officer who was returning home from his shift, heard gunshots and discovered Vincenzo Colora Sr. lying in the road outside 8 Via Sant Agostino, a narrow cobblestone lane which really wasn't very far from the town's main square. He was alive when they found him, but he wasn't conscious and he didn't make it through this injury. According to the autopsy, he was shot three different times by three different weapons. So you can assume there were three different men attacking him. His brother claimed that he was killed by the Ferrara brothers, Giovanni and Innocenzo, who followed Colora down the street from the square. So Colota was in the town square and they followed him back to his house. He made a statement to police in Campo Fioretto, a small rural town that was about 10 miles south of Corleone. And he claimed that the mafia was always watching the police station to see if anybody was dealing with the police. So like, if you were going in and out of the police station, they knew you were a rat, and they were constantly watching to see if anybody was. And obviously, that made him scared to testify. When he was called to deliver his evidence, he retracted his statement like every other person before him because the mafia had a chance to get to him. And because of that, nobody was ever charged with his brother's murder. He was the third and final man that Dr. Navarro wanted gone. There were three men that were really, really close with Legio, and they provided a lot of support in any kind of fights that Navarra and Legio would have, and they also helped him a lot with his criminal dealings. The other two men were Nino Catone and Nicola Di Alessandro. Catone was known around town as Upatre Nostru, or Our Heavenly Father, due to his generosity. He was the leader of Villabate, a historical mafia family. He had actually been in America in the past. He worked for the Perfacci brothers in New York before coming back to Italy after being kicked out of America as an undesirable. He was the mayor of Villabate, and he replaced the town's government with anti-fascist notables after World War II ended and the government had to be put back together after Mussolini. He was known to be revered and honored, and he would walk the main street every morning and afternoon to mingle with the townspeople, and they, like, legit fell at this man's feet. They loved him. He led the Mafia of the Gardens, men in Cosa Nostra that protected Palermo's fruit market men and citrus growers. He was killed on August 22nd, 1956, over a fruit and vegetable wholesale market being moved from the Zisa area to Aquasanta, igniting a violent dispute where multiple mafia leaders died. He was killed in a drive-by in his driveway after returning home late at night. He managed to make it into his house where he collapsed and died after being sprayed with six bullets. Men had like driven by with machine guns and he caught six but a lot more were shot off. D. Alessandro was the boss of Aquasanta in Palermo, and he died in that same dispute, but he died at the end of 1955. So just to be clear, Catone's choice to move the market is what ignited the feud, not his death. I kind of like confused myself there because I'm like, well, 
if Catone started the fight, how did he die after D'Alessandro if D'Alessandro died in the same feud? But it's because he started the fight in, like, mid-1955. D'Alessandro died because he was really close with Catone, so they knew his death was going to get to Catone, and then Catone died a half a year later. So when Kaluta was taken out and Legio's three closest allies were gone, Navarro is sitting pretty. He's like, yeah, I'm the best. I'm in the best situation. I'm in the best position. Screw Legio. I win. In 1958, it started to become clear to everybody around that there was some serious beef between Navarra and Legio, and something was about to go down. There was this whole beef over water and how it got delivered, and it just put a huge wrench in the relationship between the two of these guys. Like, it was a really, really bad fight. Legio and his gang started harassing Angelo Vintaloro, one of Navarro's best friends and a really powerful member of Navarro's Casca. Legio and his men started to break into his sheds and would destroy casks of wine and started stealing the wheat that was stored in there. From Legio's point of view, Vintaloro is way too involved in this feud that he's having with Navarra, and even if he can't bother Navarra so directly, he could damn sure bother his best friend. He even said that he'd stop messing with him if he was paid off. And that was it for Navarra. That was the last straw. Legio absolutely had to go. You do not mess with my friend, and then to hit him up for money to get you to lay off? Absolutely not. Navarra ordered his men to set up a plan to take out Legio, and they did. A bunch of Navarra's guys set up an ambush outside Legio's house as he and his men, including Francesco Legio, Leo Luca Legio, and Giuseppe Ruffino, returned home. The ambush was wildly unsuccessful. One of the dudes had... A problem that some men have in the bedroom, he prematurely ejaculated. Whoops, I mean evacuated his weapon, and that messed everything up. Despite being shot in the hand with a buckshot, a member of his Koska, Salvatore Satile, helped him get out of there alive, and alive he remained. Imagine being one of the dudes that were sent to kill Legio, and going back to Navarra and being like, uh, Legio survived. They are lucky that they weren't killed on the spot. Navarro seems like just enough of a psycho to take care of them right then and there for not getting the job done. There's another account of the ambush where Legio's uncle set up this ambush, ensured that nobody got seriously hurt, and all of it was to incite a war between Legio and Navarra. The different accounts of what actually happened that day have some serious implications and have been an important part of Mafia psychology probably to this day. Legio retaliated in August of 1958. Dr. Navarra had an appointment on Saturday, August 2nd. Dr. Giovanni Russo, a medical associate of his, drove him to the appointment. They rode together in Navarro's black Fiat 1100. The meeting ended by lunchtime, and as the two men were driving back to Corleone on State Highway 118, because that's where all of these guys' crimes take place, around 12.30 in the afternoon, an Alfa Romeo pulled up in front of the Fiat 1100 and came to a complete stop. Dr. Russo slammed into the back of this Alfa Romeo 1900, damaging the poor Alfa Romeo and just taking out the back of this car. Have you ever seen an Alfa Romeo? Those cars are incredible. And they intentionally let this car get hit? Monsters. At that point, the front car emptied out, and it had a whole bunch of armed men in it. And according to some reports, there was a red van that pulled up behind them and had a whole bunch of more gunmen. The hit team lit up this little Fiat with everything they had. The windows and windshield were shattered, killing both passengers immediately. Dozens, if not hundreds, of shots were fired, but Russo only took eight bullets and Navarra only took seven. 
each body contained a variety of bullet calibers, so it's pretty clear that there were multiple men on scene. When the cops arrived around 3.30 in the afternoon, which, P.S., that's wild, this whole scuffle happens at 12.30 in the afternoon, and cops don't arrive until 3.30 in the afternoon. That means that somebody reported shots fired and multiple fatalities, and it took the cops three hours to get there. Think about the implications of that. Think about what else they're dealing with. If they hear, oh yeah, there's a shootout on the highway, multiple people are dead, and it takes them three hours to get there. That is crazy pants. Even the NYPD would get there sooner than that. When the cops arrived at 3.30 in the afternoon, they discovered Dr. Russo slumped back in the driver's seat and Navarra curled up on his lap, which that's kind of sad. It isn't really 100% clear if Legia went after Navarra because he just didn't like him and he wanted to get rid of him, or if he went after him because Navarra fired the first shot. And Legio didn't feel like sitting around waiting until his men got it right the next time they attacked. There is another story that circulated about Don Jenko Russo, or Z Pepe Jenku, who was sort of an omnipotent mafia boss in Sicily, that he had had Dr. Navarra killed, and he is the one that actually sent Legio to do this, for his own personal reasons. Apparently, there was some new men on the block that were taking power, and Don Jenko, he's kind of an old head, and he did not like that these new people were coming into town. Navarro was backing these men, and he hated that even more. So the bosses in Italy, they didn't just dismiss this. He killed an acting boss. That couldn't go unanswered. But Legio didn't really put too much weight into this confrontation. When the bosses confronted him, Legio told Salvatore Greco, the leader of the senior members of the Sicilian Mafia that had confronted him, that it was a personal matter that led to him killing Navarra, and he just walked away. He walked away from the leaders of the Sicilian Mafia. The fact that they did not just body this man right there and then shows how much juice this guy really carries. According to the testimony of Tommaso Buscetta, a significant mafia figure who ended up turning informant in 1984, Legio's unprovoked murder of Dr. Navarra was the root cause of the crisis that would come to plague the mafia in the years that followed. It set into motion a cycle of murder, intrigue, and betrayal that came to characterize the Sicilian Mafia in the late 20th century. Legio started taking apart what was left of Navarro's Cosca pretty quickly after offing him. They were now led by Antonio Governale, who was aided by Giovanni Trombadori, and a group of about 20 or 30 men who supported Navarra. It became known in town as La Burrasca, the war, between Legio's group and the Navariani, who were the Cosca that were left behind by Navarra. The first victims were Marco and Giovanni Marino, followed by Pietro Mauri and Carmelo Lebu, the son of the family's former capo. The first three were killed on September 6th, four weeks after Navarro's murder, during a town procession that honored Madonna della Catina. Three pedestrians were injured in the shootout, including Anna Santa Colomba, who was 30 years old, and her two-year-old daughter. Bernardo Provenzano was shot in the head during this scuffle, but he amazingly walked away. He even managed to make it all the way to the hospital on his own, where he claimed that he had been walking down the street on his way to the movies and was just randomly shot. The doctors were way too smart to like question his story, so they bandaged him up and sent him on his way. The three men I mentioned earlier were also killed, so altogether three killed, three injured. This little war started to take a toll on the citizens in town. They started to talk amongst themselves to reporters or pretty much to anybody that would listen about how brutal these killings are, how easy it is to be caught in one, 
and how pretty much nobody was safe in the town anymore. Bastiano Orlando, Navarro's closest confidant and right-hand man, went to Palermo to try to resolve the issues with the senior members of the clan, and they never returned. And he wasn't the only one who just vanished into thin air. Antonino Gorvinale, Navarra's assistant and the one that took over as the leader of the Cosca when Navarra died, and Giovanni Trombatora, the family consigliere, both went missing on April 5th and April 10th in 1961. Bernardo Rea followed on September 22nd, Giovanni Dello on December 21st, and Vincenzo Listi on July 21st, 1962. Each one of them seemed to just vanish into thin air. They just disappeared. On September 10th, 1963, Bernardo Provenzano, Legio, Caligero, Bagarella, Salvatorina, and Bernardo Marino shot and killed Francesco Paolo Streva, Piraggio Pomilla, and Antonio Piragno. Streva was the final significant member of the Navariani. In and around Corleone, there were 153 murders between 1958 and 1963. That is absolutely bonkers for a small town. That's a pretty big number for a big town. There's 153 murders in a small town of like 11,000 people. That is crazy. That would be equivalent to 100,000 people being murdered in New York on a per capita basis. Think about the implications of 100,000 people being murdered in a five-year basis. To put that into perspective, There were 418 murders in New York in 2022, and there was 1,988 people that were murdered in 2018 through 2022, which is the last five years. Now put that number up against 100,000, and think about what New York would be like if there was that amount of murders in New York. It is absolute insanity. Like, This is going to be known throughout the entire world that this is going on. The Mafia in America referred to Corleone as a tombstone, referring to how many people died there and how dangerous the town had become. At this point, Legio is now the undisputed ruler of the depressingly small town of Corleone. He was in charge of a gang of killers and gangsters and outlaws who would go on to become notorious throughout Sicily for their brutality and butchery on a scale that would shock even the most seasoned mafioso. Think about how many killings each one of these guys have to have under their belts. Each one of these guys has to have, like, a lot. There were 2,000 known homicides or disappearances that were recorded in the four provinces of western Sicily that the Mafia controlled between 1944 and 1962. There was no other killing field like it in the entire developed world. On street corners, dead men were cremated. Like, it's like they're bags of trash. Bodies would just be dumped on the police station's steps. Like, at this point, dead bodies are becoming just a regular, everyday occurrence for these people. After he was able to take over Navarro's operation, Legio went back into his habit of vanishing into thin air. He knew the police were after him, they were coming after him for Navarro's killing, and he was not about to go down. Nobody saw or heard from him, but he was hiding in plain sight in Palermo. While he was there, he would pretend to be a police officer or a monk or like a tourist that was just wandering around. And he just wanted to, if he just wanted to get out of the house, he would like get dressed up and go out. He visited medical facilities. He received treatment for his medical ailments. He went shopping at beautiful boutiques and he went out to fine dining establishments. It's insanity that he's, like, literally two towns over and just operating under disguise. Like, how do you make a doctor's appointment being, like, one of the most looked-for men in an entire country, and you make a doctor's appointment and you show up to it? 
Maybe it was made under a fake name, but still, like, come on. Yes, he is in hiding, but he's also making a crap ton of money. He purchased large amounts of land, and he bought a gigantic villa for himself. He started working with Salvo Lima, the mayor of Palermo, and his public works assessor, Vito Chanchimano. Now, Vito was somebody that worked with Legio's father in the past, and he's known to be the only person to have ever punched Legio in the face and survived to tell the tale. They were both in the construction industry, and they started forming a really strong relationship with Legio. Because of all the killing that's happening in the area, all the top mafia figures in the entire area were either imprisoned, forced into exile, or placed on the most wanted list between 1963 and 1970. Legio was arrested on May 14, 1964. When the cops broke down the door to his house, he was found laying in bed with none other than the girlfriend of our late risotto. You know, the guy from the beginning that he killed? It's always over a girl. It doesn't matter why you think it's over. It's always over a girl. When the police searched his house, they discovered an entire stash of illegal weapons. The basement was a gold mine. There was a ton of guns everywhere, including the machine guns that were believed to have been used in the killing of Navarra six years earlier. For some reason, I see accounts all over the place saying that he had been on the run for six years. He had been on the run for 16 years. I don't really understand. I feel like maybe I'm, I'm missing something. I don't get it. So follow my logic here. Navarro was killed on August 2nd, 1958. Legio was caught on May 14th, 1964. That's four years. That's less than four years. Like, am I missing something? Where is six years and 16 years? Where is all these numbers coming from? I don't know, man. Maybe I'm stupid and there's numbers right in front of my face that I'm just completely missing, but it seems to be a pretty easy math problem. It's three years and seven months. Okay, I'm sitting here thinking I'm going insane, okay? So follow my very, very slow logic because math, first of all, it is 5.17 in the morning right now. I have not been to sleep. I've been recording this since like midnight. I keep getting tracked off like ADD to the absolute freaking max right now, okay? So we've got he was killed on August 2nd, 1958. So you got September, October, November, December. Four months right here, okay? That's this right here, four months. Now, that's going to be 1959. So you got the whole year of 1959, the whole year of 1960, the whole year of 1961. He's killed in 62. Okay, so you got three years. There's no other than that. Okay, now... He was killed in March. So you got January, February, March. That is three years and seven months. Not no six years. Not no 16 years. Three years and seven months. Not even four full years. That's not supposed to be such a point of contention, but I just don't like when I see these conflicting things. Like, how annoying. 16 years. Three years and seven months. But he did confirm that he was arrested by the Carabinieri not the state police. And the state police actually took center stage for the photographers that showed up. The photographers had been tipped off by Mangano, who, like, gave them a little ring, and he was like, yo, you want a scoop? Legio's about to get arrested. Come watch, bitches. Like, he was all about it. So, you know, Legio's getting arrested, and there's news everywhere. Because Mangano made sure of it. He made sure that the entire media of Italy was there to see Legio get arrested. Colonel Ignazio Milillo was made an honorary citizen of Corleone for his role in the capture and arrest of Legio. He was awarded the Knight Officer of Merit of the Italian Republic by the Italian head of the state and got all sorts of praise for his efforts in apprehending Sicily's most wanted man, who was laying with a man who he killed girlfriend. Just saying. Legio was arrested and transferred at 2 o'clock in the morning on May 15th to the infamous Uchardone prison in Palermo. 
Now, I looked up how to pronounce Uchardone, and interestingly enough, the name of the prison translates in English to kill some. I don't know what they were trying to do with the name of that prison. Maybe it's like some who kill. I don't know, but it translates in English to kill some, so interesting. He appeared in court in December of 1967 in what came to be known as the Trial of the 114. The first real attempt since the 1897 Palermo trials to convict the mafia as a corporate body, aka like what you would call a RICO trial in America. Legio, Tommaso Buscetta, Gaetano Badalamente, and Salvatore Catalano, a made man who would one day become the first Sicilian ever to help run an American mafia family when he took over partial control of the Bonanno crime family in New York, and who was also indicted on the pizza trial, were among those accused. Pretty much, the men that were accused in the trial of the 114 were the who's who of the Sicilian Mafia. Legio was rearrested to stand trial for nine other murders that he had been charged with being involved in, because the judge that was presiding over the case, Judge Terranova, who had issued the order for the trial in May of 1965, had dedicated his life to fighting against the Mafia, and he was determined to get Legio. This is pretty wild because Judge Terranova is one of the two judges that I brought up earlier who was killed because he put a Mafia member away. Crazy, the connection. The second trial began in February of 1969. To say that Legio hated Terranova would be an absolute understatement. While they were preparing for the trial, Legio wouldn't answer any questions that were asked of him. When he was asked about his name and his parents' name, he said he didn't remember. Terranova told the clerk, write down that Legio does not know whose son he is. And that pissed Legio off. Like, that took him from a 4 to a 10 real quick. The implication that he was a bastard? Nah, -uh. No, sir. Not here. Not today. Terranova told his wife later that night that in his response, Legio was so mad that he had foam on his lips, and he said that he believed that he would have killed him on the spot if he could. Legio and nearly his entire Cosca of 64 men who had also been indicted were found not guilty of the main charges. They were found guilty of stealing wheat, but nothing that would require any jail time. As soon as the trial was over in 1969, Caesar Terranova, or Judge Terranova, appealed against Legio's acquittal for Navarra and started going after him in court again. Once again, I'm going to bitch and moan and gripe about Italy's double jeopardy laws, which are absolutely ridiculous. As a judge or a prosecutor, you can just keep coming after somebody in court until you find a jury that agrees with you, and that is all kinds of bullshit. That is so wrong. You can get found not guilty of something by a jury of your peers, and then they can just keep taking you to court over and over and over and over again. Legio was supposed to be rearrested by Palermo authorities after being released on bail in 1969, but instead he went to a private hospital in Reggio Calabria for bladder treatment. After he was treated, he just walked out. Somehow he avoided all his guards. He avoided everybody that was put in place to not allow him to leave, and he just disappeared in a black Mercedes that was driven by his old friend, Frank Coppola. From there, Legio relocated to Milan. In February of 1971, Legio ordered the kidnapping of Antonio Caruso, son of the industrialist Giacomo Caruso, and also that of the son of the builder, Francesco Vassallo, who was kidnapped in Palermo. Obviously, the point of these kidnappings is extortion, ransom, money. Legio was linked to the murder of General Attorney of Sicily, Pietro Scaglione, who was killed on May 5th, 1971, with his police bodyguard, Antonio LaRusso. The prosecution tried Legio in absentia, which means that he didn't actually go to court, he wasn't there, and he was found guilty for the Navarra murder. 
which I find absolutely insane. They tried this man without him there. They tried him. They did an entire trial with witnesses and everything after he had already been found not guilty or acquitted of this murder. And they did an entire trial while he wasn't there. Absolutely bonkers. Italy has the most corrupt laws, I swear. He was finally captured in Milan on May 16th, 1974. He was sentenced to life in prison in 1975, and he was imprisoned at Badu i Caros prison in Nuoro, Sardinia. It's said that Legio ordered the killing of Judge Terranova in 1979 as revenge for the insults of pretty much calling him a bastard in the 1960s, and that the murder was approved by the Sicilian Mafia Commission. Most likely that's not true. As I spoke about in my previous video, Terranova was more than likely killed for finding Salvatore Rina guilty and sentencing him to life in prison. It's a nice bedtime story, though. Legia was charged with ordering Terranova's murder, but he was acquitted due to lack of evidence. Both in the first trial, which was held in Reggio Calabria in 1983, and three years later in 1986, in the appeal process, because you know they're going to just keep coming after him even though he's found not guilty or appealed or acquitted or whatever. By the end of the 1970s, his lieutenant, Salvatore Rina, was in control of the entire Corleonesi clan. In the Maxi trial of 1986 and 1987, the jury rejected the prosecution's call for 15 years in prison for Legio. The jury also acquitted him of the four murders that had been brought against him when prosecutors claimed that he masterminded four murders from his jail cell in Sardinia. At the time, he was known for pictures taken of him in court wearing aviator sunglasses and smoking a cigar yet again. He was also pictured with his chin resting on his fingers like this. And it's believed that Marlon Brando based his mannerisms of Don Vito on this picture for The Godfather. On November 15, 1993, Luciano Leggio died of a heart attack in prison at age 68. He was buried in Corleone. So that is all I have for Luciano Leggio, the man, the myth, the legend. Leggio was portrayed by Stephen Graham in The Irishman, by Marlon Brando in The Godfather. This has kind of been up for debate since the movie was made, but since he played the role of Vito Corleone and Leggio ran the Corleonesi and was from Corleone, it's more than likely based on him, but I've heard that it was based on Frank Costello too, so I don't really know. He was photographed in the photo series Shooting the Mafia. He was portrayed by Stefano Dionisi in a TV movie named Men of Corleone. And there's a whole shit ton of movies, TV shows, and TV movies in Italian that were all based on him. He even portrayed himself in a TV movie called Processo alla Mafia in a TV miniseries called Corleone. A History of La Cosa Nostra, and in a TV series called Blue Note. In 1987, the underboss of the Catania Mafia clan in eastern Sicily, Antonio Calderon, described Legio to authorities when he began working with the police. He described Legio as a man who liked to kill. He said that he had a way of looking at people that could frighten anybody, even us mafiosi. The smallest thing set him off. And then a strange light would appear in his eyes that created silence around him. When you were in his company, you had to be careful how you spoke. The wrong tone of voice, a misunderstood word, and all of a sudden, that silence falls. Everything would go instantly hushed, uneasy, and you could just smell death in the air. He was frequently described as a dog with no master, ready to go for a priest, an old woman, a policeman, or anyone else. He's known now as the Sicilian John Gotti for his ability to avoid convictions ranging from homicide to racketeering, until that final one like John Gotti. So what do you think about the Luciano Leggio story? 
Do you believe that he was as powerful and dreadful as he was made out to be? Or do you think his killing habit was a little bit exaggerated and the persona that he tried to build in front of the cameras worked out to trick us? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. Join me next week as I delve into the lives and legacies of some of the most fascinating and infamous figures in history. And please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, follow, do all the things. And I'll see you next week. Bye!